Now today, friends, I want to begin in 2 Samuel 19, but you'll recall that I left off last time as we looked at the tender grief of David, the tender love he had for his son Absalom. And when word was brought to him, it was a real heartbreak to him. And we find here an expression of grief that you could not find in any literature anywhere as it is here. O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. There are several reasons for the extreme grief of David. First of all, I think that David was not sure about the salvation of this young man. You will recall when his first son by Bathsheba was born, that son died. And when David heard that the boy was dead, the little fellow, David arose, washed his face, sat down at a banquet and rejoiced. And his servants couldn't understand it. He made it very clear. He said, I'm going to him someday. He won't come to me. And that'll be a great day when he'll go to him. He knew where the little fellow was. Now, at the death of Absalom, this young man, it breaks David's heart. Why? Because he doesn't know where he is. He's not sure of his salvation. The fact of the matter is, I'm of the opinion David felt that he was not saved. And it was a real heartbreak to David. And again, we must call your attention to the fact that David was a great king, but a very poor father. He never quite succeeded in being an outstanding father. And this boy is an example of it. Then another reason is David recognizes that these things are happening to him because of the sin he committed. God told him that there would never depart from his house strife and this type of thing. And it never left his house. But I believe that from here on, you're going to find that David is a broken man. Up to this point, David is a man, great energy. But from here on, David is a broken man. Again, I think part of his grief was due to his disappointment. He had really hoped that Absalom might succeed him to the throne. He didn't like the idea of him rebelling against him, but he at least wanted him to succeed to the throne. Now, the grief of David was such that even Joab was disturbed by it and rebuked David for it. And I'm beginning now in chapter 19, verse 1. And it was told Joab, Behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people, for the people heard say that day, how the king was grieved for his son. In other words, it should have been a great day of victory and a day of rejoicing. But for David, it was not a victory at all. It was defeat, and it was a time of grief and of sorrow that was beyond expression. The people get them by stealth that day into the city, as people being ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. Why, they just left the battlefield after a victory and just retreated right back into Jerusalem as if they had been defeated and they were victorious. Why? Because Absalom was slain, and it had broken the heart of David. But the king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice. Listen to him here. O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son my son. How David loved this boy. What a tender expression this is. And I think, friends, when you go through the Word of God and you find this wonderful relationship between father and son, Abraham offering Isaac, God spared not his own son. Certainly that's a reference to the offering of Isaac. And then you find this wonderful relationship that David had a relationship in the sense he loved Absalom. He'd been such a poor father. He'd handled it so badly. But he loved this boy. 
And he's a broken man. Now, Joab, who was responsible for his death, and I'm not sure David ever really comprehended just how he died. I'm sure there were quite a few stories told to him how he died. And I'm not sure David would want to pursue that too far. Verse 5, And Joab came into the house to the king and said, Thou hast shamed this day the faces of all thy servants, which this day have saved thy life, and the lives of thy sons and of thy daughters, and the lives of thy wives and the lives of thy concubines, in that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. For thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived, and all we had died this day, then it had pleased thee well. Now, of course, Joab is pushing it to the opposite extreme, but certainly David would have preferred others dying rather than Absalom, and that was quite evident here. And Joab is rebuking him because of the fact that he actually grieved at the death of Absalom, who had become his enemy and would have killed David, could he have gotten to him. Now, will you notice verse 8? Then the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told unto all the people, saying, Behold, the king doth sit in the gate. And all the people came before the king, for Israel had fled every man to his tent. You see, the people needed some rallying point now. I mean, after all, what is the real state of affairs when the man who led the rebellion has been slain, and instead of rejoicing, why, the greatest grief that David ever expressed. So David now goes up to the gate and lets people know that it'll be business as usual. He's back on the throne. Now David returns to Jerusalem, and all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king saved us out of the hand of our enemies, and he delivered us out of the hand of the Philistines, and now he's fled out of the land for Absalom. And Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why speak ye not a word of bringing the king back? What happened is simply this. There were those that had gone over with Absalom. Now, their point is, what are we going to do? And the best thing we can do is to bring the king back. And verse 11 and King David sent to Zadok and to Biath of the priests, saying, Speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, Why are ye the last to bring the king back to his house, seeing the speech of all Israel has come to the king, even to his house? Apparently, even in the tribe of Judah, there had been a great defection, and many had gone over to Absalom. And now David is rebuking them, for this, you see, the thought here is, Ye are my brethren. Listen to David as he speaks to them in verse 12. Ye are my brethren, ye are my bones, my flesh. Wherefore then are ye the last to bring back the king? And say ye to Amasa, Art thou not of my bone and of my flesh? God do so to me and more also. If thou be not captain of the host before me continually, in the room of Joab. And he bowed the heart of all the men, even as the heart of one man, so that they sent this word unto the king, Return thou and all thy servants. So the king returned. He came to Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to go to meet the king, to conduct the king over Jordan. And Shimei, the son of Gera, Benjamite, which was of Behurim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah, to meet David. And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba the servant of the house of Saul, and his fifteen sons, his twenty servants with him. And they went over Jordan before the king. Now you see this boy Shimei had cursed David when he went out. Now he wants to be the first now to welcome him back. And now we find here, verse 18, there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household, and to do what he thought good. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan, and said unto the king, 
Let not my Lord impute iniquity unto me, neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that my Lord the king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. For thy servant doth know that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I am come the first this day of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai the son of Zeruah answered and said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this? Because he cursed the Lord's anointing. Now listen to David. David's a generous fellow. He was a man that could forgive. David said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruah, that ye should this day be adversaries unto me? Shall there any man be put to death this day in Israel? For do not I know that I am this day king over Israel? Why should I pay attention to this fellow? I'm king of Israel. I know I'm king. David was satisfied in that position. Why should I worry about a little fellow like this? And why should I put him to death? He doesn't amount to anything. And a great many Christians today let little things bother us, and we let little people bother us and worry us, and we ought not to. Is God blessing you, my friend? And I may be speaking today to a discouraged pastor. You having trouble with a board of deacons? Are you having trouble with some deacon? My friend, forget it. You're serving God. God's on your side. Live above that. Serve the Lord. Make sure that's what you're doing. Forget about those things. Oh, my, we need to live above those things, you see. Listen to David now, verse 23. Therefore the king said unto Shimei, Thou shalt not die. And the king swore unto him. He said, Well, I don't intend to punish you. I'm not going to deal with you at all. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king and had neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. You see, Mephibosheth, in deep appreciation to David, you see, he wouldn't join in the rebellion. He stayed with David, and during all this time, he's fasted and prayed for David. Wonderful to have friends like that, you know. And we find here, And it came to pass, when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For thy servant said, I'll saddle me an ass that I may ride thereon and go to the king, because thy servant is lame. And he hath slandered thy servant unto my lord the king. But my lord the king is an angel of God. Do therefore what's good in thine eyes. For all of my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king, yet didst thou set thy servant among them that did eat at thine own table, what right, therefore, have I yet to cry any more unto the king? Mephibosheth said, If you think I have betrayed you, well, you do as you please. I have no right to ask any other favor of you at all. The king said unto them, Why speakest thou any more of thy matters? I have said, Thou and Ziba divide the land. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Let him take all, for as much as my lord the king is come again in peace unto his own house. And Barzilla the Gileadite came down from Rogelim and went over Jordan with the king to conduct him over Jordan. Now, Barzilla was a very aged man, even fourscore years old. He'd provided the king of sustenance while he lay at Maonaim, where he was a very great man. Now, this patriarch of another nation... You remember, had been generous to David and gave him everything. And David said, now you come go with me, because I want to reward you. I want to do something for you. And the king said unto Barzilla, come thou over with me. I'll feed thee with me in Jerusalem. And Barzilla said unto the king, how long have I to live that I should go up with the king unto Jerusalem? He said, I have many more years. I know my days are numbered. And I'd just rather stay at home. <laughs> I appreciate your 
generous offer of going and living in a palace, but he's reached the age where those things did not tempt him at all. Listen to him, verse 35. I am this day fourscore years old. And can I discern between good and evil? Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any more the voice of singing men and singing women? Wherefore then should thy servant be yet a burden unto my Lord the King? Why, he says, I'm an old man. I can't hear the music anymore. Food doesn't taste like it did one time. And I don't want to come and mar the party. I don't want to be the one that would slow down the king and his enjoyment. I wouldn't want to do that at all. Thy servant will go a little way over Jordan with the king, and why should the king recompense it me with such a reward? Why do you want to do this, David? I did it for you because I've got confidence in you. I know you're God's man and all of that. And that was the motivation for this man and And he said, you're more than generous, David. David was a generous man. He was a revengeful man, too. David was a hot-headed man. But David was a generous man. We need to recognize that. It's too bad he hadn't been a little more generous with his own son. When Absalom sinned and came back, if he had only forgiven him, if he'd only received him like the father received the prodigal son by putting his arms around him, put a robe on him, and killing a calf, and having a big time, a high old time, I tell you, it would have been a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I think he'd have spared himself this awful rebellion that had taken place. And this is something, of course, again, we need to note. Now, in chapter 20, we come to Another thing, you would think after all of this that the Lord would let up on David. But now a Benjamite leads a revolt against David, a man by the name of Sheba. And Joab put down the revolt. Joab also slew a Mesa, who apparently should have put the revolt down, but didn't, didn't move at all. And so we're still in a very bloody era. And we're seeing that certainly trouble is not departed from the house of David. And I do not hear him whimpering or crying aloud at all in what has taken place at all. Now let me read, beginning at verse 1 of chapter 20. And there happened to be there a man of Belial, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tents, O Israel. Now this man, Sheba, is attempting to lead a rebellion, you see. So every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah clave unto their king from Jordan, even unto Jerusalem. Now, it's amazing how faithless and how undependable The people were. And you say, well, that was a crude day, and it was way back in the Dark Ages, and it was such a dawn of history, and man was not developed in that day, and he was not civilized. I'd like to ask you a question. Do you think it's any better today? Isn't it interesting that the president of this country or any public official can make some little statement stump his toe, rather stump his tongue, by the way, and maybe say something that maybe shouldn't have said. But then they take a poll and find out that his popularity has been downgraded even enough that he couldn't even be elected to office next time. And that happens to any office holder, a public figure, whether he be a Democrat or Republican or whether he be something else. It just doesn't seem to matter. Why? Well, it shows how fickle the mob is and the crowd is. It shows how fickle all of us are. And you know, God knows that. God knows our heart. The heart is desperately wicked. Who really can know it? Now, whose heart is he talking about? Stalin's heart? The heart of Ho Chi Minh? No, your heart and my heart. That's the one he's talking about. 
And these are the things that are in the human heart. Paul says, I know that within my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Now, all Israel goes after, that is the ten tribes, go after this fellow Sheba. And David came to his house at Jerusalem. I'm reading at verse 3. And the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in ward and fed them, but went not in unto them, so they were shut up unto the day of their death, living in widowhood. These are the ones you remember that Absalom had taken. Now, Joab wants to put down this rebellion. Joab, also a brutal man, and he is a bloody man, and he was the captain of David, but he was loyal, and he was faithful to him, and to the very end. Then said the king to Amasa, Samuel me the man of Judah, within three days, and be thou here present. So Amasa went to assemble a man of Judah, but he tarried longer than the set time which he'd appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now shall Sheba the son of Bichri do us more harm than did Absalom? Take thou thy lord's servant, pursue after him, lest he get him fenced cities and escape us. In other words, this man uh, Mesa's not moving. And what happened was just simply this, that we find Joab goes after him. And I tell you, he slew him because of the fact that he was a traitor to David. And it was obvious that that is what it was. So Joab then takes out after Sheba and puts down this revolt. My poor David, he doesn't have a moment of peace, you see. But he's not crying aloud. He's not whimpering at all. He knows that the Lord has taken him to the woodshed. Don't tell me David got by with sin, friend. He didn't get by, but he did love God. And underneath the faith that failed was a faith that never failed. That's David, God's man, the man after God's own heart. Now we come, friends, here in the 21st chapter of Second Samuel to a period of famine in the land of Israel. And the reason that God gives for it seems rather strange, but in it again there's a great lesson for us. I'm reading now Second Samuel 21, 1. Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It's for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them. And Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver nor gold of Saul, nor of his house, neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What ye shall say, that will I do for you. And they answered the king, The man that consumed us and that devised against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coasts of Israel. Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, We'll hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. But notice, but the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. Now, this is quite a remarkable passage of Scripture. First of all, let's note that Way back in the days of Joshua, the Gibeonites deceived Joshua, but they made a treaty with him. And a treaty in that day, which was uncivilized, was inviolate. That is, they kept the terms of the treaty. Treaties were more than a scrap of paper. Treaties were more than that which was to be broken. Among nations today, this matter of sitting down at a conference table... And trying to make a treaty is almost laughable, because who keeps it? 
And we find that the average person has a right to be cynical relative to the way that nations attempt to get along with each other. But in that day, nations' word was as good as its bond. And when they made a treaty, they kept it. And so when Saul came along, he broke that treaty. And David attempted to make amends for it. And he did. But the other side of the coin is interesting. God didn't forget that Saul had broken that treaty. And his people, they're not going to get by with it. And so three years of famine come upon them as a judgment. Now, let me make this kind of an application that I think is valid. And that is that you and I live in a day when it cannot be said that any particular nation is chosen of God. That is, right now the nation Israel is scattered. God today is calling a people out of this world to his name from all tribes and tongues and nations. And you cannot say that a particular nation is the chosen nation today. But God does deal with nations. And God does judge nation. And God holds nations responsible. And it doesn't make any difference what nation it is. God judged Egypt. God judged Babylon. God judged Assyria, Greece, Rome. And God will judge America. And I'm of the opinion, and will you cure me now very carefully, I believe that we're in the process of dissolution as a nation. There are several evidences of God's judgment upon us. Now, let me just mention several things. Since World War II, it was our intention to be a great peacemaking nation, but live in sin. And believe me, my friend, after World War II, America started out plunging into sin. But you know, we couldn't quit fighting, and there hasn't been a moment since World War II But what we're fighting somewhere, if it isn't in Vietnam, it is in Korea. If it isn't in Korea, why, we're yonder in Europe with a tremendous force. We are talking peace today as we've never talked it before. And there's no peace, my friend. God says, there's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Now, there are other indications of this dissolution. We have no great statesmen today. Now, I recognize that there are quite a few of the boys over in Washington think that they're clever. And that's not confined to any one political party. I think they all feel like they could solve the problems of the world. And actually, it's rather pitiful today to see this nation without great leadership. We do not have it today and haven't had it since World War II. Well, we never had it then. But the point is that that is another evidence of judgment. You remember God said to his people, I'm going to give women to rule over you. Believe me, there's been a movement in that direction also. Then, may I say that right here in Southern California, we are the center of pornography. We send out all the cults and the isms from here. And God gave us quite a shaking. I'm of the opinion that the earthquake was a judgment of God. Now, I know that there's the scientific explanation that we have a San Andreas fault and we have several other faults. In fact, we got a whole lot of faults out here. And I'm of the opinion that God is beginning to judge America today. Lawlessness, gross immorality. May I say to you, God judges nations. And if there's one thing that chapter 21 reveals... It reveals that. Also, we find that David is carrying on a continual warfare with the Philistines. And we read here in verse 15, Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. And Ishbi Benob which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass and weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. 
But Abishai the son of Zeruah succored him, and smote the Philistine, and killed him. Then the men of David swore unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. David was a great man, and they knew there was no one to take his place. And so David is getting to be an old man now, and when he goes out to battle, why, he's about to be overcome. And that was unusual for David, and these leaders of Israel see that. They tell him, you're not going out with us anymore. You must stay home. Now we're told here that there was a great battle. God gave the victory to Israel, and we're told in verse 22... These four were born to the giant in Gath, and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Now, the giant was Goliath. You will recall that we mentioned this before, that when David went out to meet Goliath, he took five smooth stones. And I've heard it described rather vividly that David thought he might miss with one, and then he'd have another one if he missed with it. He had five stones, and that, of course, would be a great lesson that we ought to have a reserve. Well, may I say to you, David didn't have a reserve. Here's the evidence of it right here. That giant had four sons, and they were sitting over there in the lines of the Philistine. And David knew that when he slew the giant, that those four sons might want to come out. He had a stone for each one of them. The interesting thing here, we are told that he slew them also. Now, I do not know whether he did it at that time. I don't think he did. But he got to them later on because these boys are going to take revenge. And they are big fellows, too. They took after their father. And David slew these five, you see. He had five stones, one for each one of them. This idea that David was carrying reserve stones is a mistake. This boy was accurate with the slingshot. If you'd been there with the sheep, you would have seen him maybe practice several hours every day. I think he could put a stone in a hollow in a tree that was not even big enough for a squirrel to crawl in. David was accurate with this. Now we come to 2 Samuel 22, and here is David's great song of deliverance. After God had delivered him, From all of his enemies, he sang this song. Now, I'm going to bypass it here, because when I come to the book of Psalms, I'll spend some time with this psalm. I'd like to call attention, however, to several features concerning it. It opens like this. And David spoke unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him, out of the hand of all his enemies, and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, now, this is the song that David composed, apparently, at the end of his life, when he looked back over his life, and he could see how the hand of God had moved in his life and brought him to the place of old age. This is, I think it was at the same time that David not only composed Psalm 18, which is this chapter. But he also composed, I think, Psalm 23 at this time, when he said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He looked back over his life, and he could say, The Lord is my shepherd. And Paul put it like this for you and me, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Has God brought you up to this moment, friend? And why in the world do you think he's going to let you down now? And David now could sing this song. Listen to just a portion of it here. The Lord is my rock. That's a place to rest upon. Christ is the rock of our salvation. He's the foundation. We rest on him. And my fortress, that's for protection in life, and my deliverer. That's in the time of temptation. The God of my rock. The Lord is not only a rock, but he's the God of my rock, my faith. He's the object of my faith. In him will I trust. He's my shield. He protects me from the enemy. 
and the horn of my salvation. He is the one that I rest in for salvation. He's my high tower. That's where I go to view the land. He's my vision and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. May I say to you, we're also living in a day when we do not have anything that corresponds to genius in the way of writing. There's no great vision today. Everything is run today by a computer. Everything is already taped, and we are a scientific age. We know how to add two plus two equals four. Well, we don't seem to produce anything really original today. After all, the best thing a computer can do is just say two plus two equals four. And I don't know about you, I've heard that enough. I'm a little tired, weary of hearing that. Oh, how monotonous life becomes when you leave God out of it. Now, verse 36, Thou hast also given me the shield of my salvation, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Now, David was a rough and rugged man. David was a hot-headed man. But God is gentle. And David's love and association with God had really quieted him down. It had stoked the fire. It had made him a gracious man. Thy gentleness hath made me great. We need to associate more with God today. My, how man need that in this hour in which we're living. This is a great psalm, and I just can't wait to get to the book of Psalms. They're so wonderful. They open up the heart. They open up the mind. They open up the life. They let you live, friends. We are hearing so much about people wanting to live. We have comforts and gadgets galore today. And these kids that are in homes of affluence, homes where they have comforts and everything, they leave that and go out and live a hippie life. They want to live, they say. My friend, things won't enable you to live. And just running out, throwing off all the bands and the cords that God has bound us with, that's not the way to live. It's only when you and I come into a right relationship with God that we are enabled to live. This is a great psalm that we have here. And this is a psalm David composed at the end of his life when he looked back over it. And when we get to Psalm 23, you will find out that I take the position that Psalm 23 was not written by a little immature boy. Psalm 23, it's not a protest of a college student who doesn't know really what life is all about. And it's not written by a middle-aged man who has great ambition to get to the top, either in business or politics, or become famous. Psalm 23 is written by an old king who looks back over his life and sees the hand of God has moved in his life. He is a man that's tasted everything. There's nothing this world had that David didn't taste, my friend. And David said that the most wonderful thing of all is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Wonderful today to have a shepherd like that. By the way, what kind of a shepherd do you have today? How are you making it out yonder in the world, friend? Is it rough and tough and hard and difficult for you today? You're trying to expand your mind with drugs? I have a letter from an ex-hippie. I'm finding many of these are turning to Christ. I'm finding many that are getting into the Word of God, and they're finding out here's a book that's got something. This is not smutty story written in modern literature today by some sophisticate that does not have genius at all. He just has a dirty mind. May I say to you that multitudes are finding a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is something quite wonderful and something that is worthwhile. That was David. Oh, how David. He says, as the heart panneth after the water brook, so panneth 
my soul after thee, O God. Now, I come to chapter 23, and chapter 23 of David's final words. And we have a list of David's mighty men. We won't talk about them in detail today because here's another section that is repeated over in First Chronicles. And actually, over there, we are given more detail concerning these mighty men. And at that time, I want to have a roll call of them. But there's some things here we must look at. Now, let me just open this chapter here with verse 1. Now, these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. I wish that we had time to talk about each one of them. He's the son of Jesse. Jesse was a peasant, a farmer, down at Bethlehem. David is never ashamed of that. And God lifted him up on high, put him with the great men of the world. And he's the anointed of the God of Jacob. Now, the same God that took that clever, conniving fellow Jacob and made him Israel, a prince with God, is the same God that took David and put him on the throne. And you know that he is the same God that saved me. And he's the same God that saved you. And he's gracious, and he's good, and he's loving. Oh, my friend, how wonderful our God is. And now he's the sweet psalmist of Israel. Well, I have to leave him there. I can't even carry a tune. But David was a musician. He wrote music. He played music. He loved to hear music. And I can only say the last. I'm sure that all of you know, but now I'm a squire. I don't care for the rock music at all. In fact, to me, it's not even music. And I don't care about it being brought into the church today. But you see, I'm just a retired preacher now, and I can say that. I think it ought to be taken out of the church. But I think music, good music, elevating music, music that thrills the soul, that is the thing that's wonderful today, and I love that. And we're going to look at his psalms later on. I won't be singing any of them, so don't worry. But we will be looking at them, because the thing that always interests me about a song, well, the tune is important. I either like it or don't like it, and I'm sure that's your experience. But I listen to the words of hymns. I can't sing, but I follow those words. And frankly, many of our hymns, our gospel songs, A lot of the modern ones are absolutely puerile. They're sickening, by the way. They are absolutely sickening. And they are filled with saccharine sweetness that is absolutely foreign to the teaching of the Word of God. But I better not get off on that. Let's continue with David now. Verse 2, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The Spirit of God came upon David, and that's the way he wrote his psalms. That's the way men, as Peter tells us, moved by the Holy Spirit, carried along by the Spirit of God. They wrote in the Old Testament. Now we find that here, he says, The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. I wish today that it could be said we are a Christian nation. We are not. The decisions that are made today in government, regardless of party, so obvious, they are not made in fear of God. They are made in fear of the voters. And therefore, no effort is being made to please God today in government. Every effort is being made to please God. The voters, the one thing, the all-important thing, the mark of success is to be elected. And believe me, people are being taken in today. I was rather amused listening to some men that were out of work because of a decision made in Washington by the Senate. 
And the interesting thing is, each one of these men was out of work. And he said, well, I voted for that man because he said he was going to vote for this project. And he voted against the project. Well, that's what you get for voting for politicians, friend. All he wanted was to be elected to office. May I say, we need men that ruling in the fear of God. And until we get that, we're going to have corruption in high places. Now, verse 4, And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth. Even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Now listen to David here. This is one of the more remarkable statements that David made. You'll recall that back in 2 Samuel, the 7th chapter, I said that is one of the great chapters of the Bible. It's God's covenant with David. God said, I'll bring in your line one, and that is the same one that God had promised to Eve in the Garden of Eden, the same one that God promised to Abraham, renewed the covenant to Isaac and Jacob. It's the same one that Moses talked about, Joshua talked about him, and now we find David having had this covenant made with him by the Lord. Verse 5, Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and sure, for this is my salvation, and all my desire, although he made it not to grow. Now, what David is saying is simply this. My house is not worthy of this. We didn't get this by merit. It's not because of who I am. If he'd have got what was his just deserts, God had never made a covenant with him. Of course not. And he wouldn't have saved you, friends, or me, if it had been on the basis of merit. Yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. Now, God's covenant with us is John 3.16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, and he says, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. I hold on to that. God made that covenant. I never asked him to make it. He made it. He didn't make it because of who we are. He didn't wait for me to make a suggestion. He did it 1,900 years ago. He says, here it is. Take it or leave it. I take it. By the way, I rest upon that. Now, he says, it's ordered in all things. And sure, you can depend on God. And David says, this is my salvation. Well, God's covenant with me is my salvation. And it's what I desire, my friend. That should be the desire of the believer's heart, although he made it not to grow. Now, we move on down here, and we're given a catalog of the mighty men of David. Verse 8, it says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. And these are the men that you will recall came to David during the time that he was exiled. Now, in our notes that we're sending out, or have sent out for 2 Samuel, and I trust you have them for 1 and 2 Samuel, we have there a message, and to me it's the high point of this entire area concerning David. It's water from the well at Bethlehem. Well, what is that? Well, it's when David was being driven by Saul, an outcast, hunted like a partridge, as he says, and having to hide in the dens of the earth, there came to him those that were in distress. They were persecuted, and they were oppressed by Saul, and they came to David. And we have here others that came that got in debt, and they couldn't pay their debt. And others were just discontented, bitter of soul, and they came to David. And that's the way you come to Christ, if you recognize that you're in distress today. And then a debt, the debt of sin. He canceled that debt of sin for us. And are you discontented with life? If you're living it up, friends, and you're a swinger and you're doing all right, I guess I don't have any message for you at all. But if you are discontented, down deep in your soul, 
You want to be saved. You want to have fellowship with God. Down deep in your heart, you want this guilt complex satisfied, and you want satisfaction in your life. You come to Christ. He'll make it up. Now, these men came to David like that, and these men are outstanding. They did many very wonderful things. I mentioned one or two of them here. Verse 11, we're told, and after him was Shammah, the son of A.G., and almost was Maggi, by the way, the Hararite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. This one came, he's the one gathered a troop, and he's the one that fought for David. And then we're told here about three of the thirty chiefs went down and came to David in the harvest time under the cave of Adullam, and the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in a hole, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. You know, David is brought up there in Bethlehem. And if you were raised in a little town like I was, maybe had a we had a windmill in the backyard. It was in West Texas, and it's that old jip water they had out there. But, you know, I couldn't wait to get back there one time and I just lay down on the ground by the faucet by that well and just lapped up that water. My, it's delicious. I was raised on it. Took me back to my boyhood. Now, David wanted that water. He never gave a command to anybody to go get him water. But three of these mighty men, they broke through the Philistines. My, I tell you, that's the way they became mighty men. And I think of the command the Lord Jesus gave to go into all the world, preach the gospel, and I think back in the past to the men that broke through the enemy's lines and took the gospel. Think of the missionaries, these pioneer missionaries. I don't like to mention just one. There's so many to mention. But I think of men like Martin Luther. Well, Paul the Apostle, you'd have to start with him. And there were so many. There was a great company that followed after, and they've been breaking through the lines and getting the word out. These are mighty men of David. And we find that in verse 20, And Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab, and he went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. And I love that one, by the way. This fellow slew a lion. Now, that's not an easy thing to do, but he did it when there was snow on the ground. I know a lot of people won't even come to church when it sprinkles rain on the sidewalk. And I say to you, they couldn't have much fellowship with this fellow. He was out there when there's snow on the ground. He slew a lion. He's a tremendous man, by the way. And then verse 39, Uriah the Hittite. And then that's that blot on the escutcheon of David. But it's here. It has to be here, you see. Now in chapter 24 we find another sin of David. And actually, there are not many that will label this a sin. I have called this another sin in the life of David. And God's side, it was about as bad as the other, because if you be guilty of one part of the law, you're guilty of all. What he did was he did not believe God. And it's evidenced in this. Verse 1 of chapter 24 And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host which was with him, Go now through all the tribes of Israel. Now, at the beginning, God had David number the people. And that was to encourage him. That was to strengthen him. That was to let him know that there is a great army back of it. Now, that corresponds to what the Lord Jesus said. If the king's going against an enemy, he's going to sit down and figure whether he'll be able to do it or not. And that's what God wants him to do. And friends, that's what God wants you and me to do. Faith is not a leap in the dark. It's not a gamble. Faith is not even a hope so. Faith is a sure thing. God never asks you to believe something that's not true. 
faith rests upon a rock. Our God is a rock, a sure foundation. And he wants you to rest on that. Now, faith, therefore, is not just leaping out into space. But there is a time in your life, my friend, when you need to live and move by faith and recognize you can't do it by your effort or by numbers. And that, unfortunately, the church today has not learned to trust God. And as a result, all the congregational meetings, the spiritual victories are never mentioned. The thing that's mentioned is how much money we got in the treasure, how many we baptized this year, how many members we took in. And if the thing looks pretty good in figures, we consider it's a great spiritual victory. And it might have been the worst thing in the world that could have happened to that church. David sinned and numbering the people here. Why? David now is an old king. David knows that God has put a foundation in under him, and he knows he can overcome the enemy. He didn't need to number these people at all. I think that sometime today the curse of the church is to have a fellow in it that's always figuring up something, always putting it down in black and white, knows nothing about the spiritual victories that we should be having. And that is the thing that David did here. Now God gives him a choice of punishment. David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. I'm reading verse 10. And David said unto the Lord, I've sinned greatly in that I've done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I've done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David, told him, and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in the land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies, while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise, and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. Now David's answer here is remarkable. Listen to this. And this reveals that here's a man that did know how to trust God. I've said before, I repeated, it's important. David's faith failed. It's true. And he committed a sin. But down beneath that faith, there was a faith that never failed. And David did trust God. Listen to him. Verse 14, And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. God says here are three things. Choose the one. And David didn't choose any one of them. David said to the Lord, he said, I just don't want to fall into the hand of a man. And that's one of the things that I've always prayed in my ministry. Oh, God, never put me in a position where I am subject to a man or man. And fortunately, as I look back on my ministry, God never put me in that position where I had to click shoe leather. I tell you, I feel sorry today for some man in the ministry today that they have to go around licking shoe leather in order to continue. God have mercy on me. Now, David says, I don't want to be subject to man. Let me fall into the hands of God. Oh, I, he knows how to trust God and how wonderful it is and you see David doing that. And the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel. That was the thing then that God sent. He says, I just want to fall in the hands of God, and I know it'll be all right, even when he punishes you. And friends, in the time of trouble today, when God does discipline us, in whom the Lord loveth, he disciplines, may I say to you, there's a tenderness in it all, and there is a comfort in it all, and there is a blessing in it all, he alone can wipe away the tears. He alone can bind up the brokenhearted. He alone can heal the wounds that are in the heart. Oh, the doctor can sew you up when you've been in an accident. But in these great emotional accidents of life only, the Lord Jesus, my friend, can bind you back up and put you together again. How we need him today on the threshold of our lives. 
Now we come in the last part of this book here, the last thing is that David now wants to build a temple for the Lord. And verse 18, And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Araunah, the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of the Lord, went up as the Lord commanded. And Araunah looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Araunah went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Araunah said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to see his servant? David said, to buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And around us said unto David, Let my lord the king take an offer up that seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did around as a king give unto the king. And around us said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Araunah, Nay, but I'll surely buy it of thee at a price. Now listen to David. Here is a noble thing that David says, and oh, that God's people would learn this today. We say, oh, we shouldn't mention finances in God's work today. Well, I recognize there's an overemphasis on it, and there's too much emphasis probably on that side. But listen to David, my friend. This man around wanted to give him the threshing floor. David said, you can't give it to me. I'm going to pay you for it. Why? He says this, Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. God have mercy on folk today that are taking a spiritual free ride. May I say, pay your way. And God will honor you, and God will bless you. Oh, today, I find that there are several groups, singing groups, and several pictures that have been made, Christian pictures. They couldn't even pay for these. They couldn't pay the expenses of the singing groups. You know why? Because people wouldn't give. And now they're charging, and they're having to charge, and that people criticizing them, oh, you shouldn't do that. But it's the same crowd that never gave anything. My friend, you can go to the music center in Los Angeles. I've never been there, never even been in it. But I'm told it it would cost you $5 to get way up in the balcony where you'd have to have the music piped to you. You're so far away. But people will go hear wonderful Christian music or to a wonderful service, and they're blessed and give nothing. David says, I'll never offer to God that which costs me nothing. And I say, hallelujah, David. You're a remarkable man. In fact, there are very few men like you, even in this day. David says, I'll never offer to God anything. It doesn't cost me something. And David bought the threshing floor. And you know where that threshing floor is? That's where the Mosque of Omar is today. That's where the Temple of Solomon was built. Temple of David, because David's the one who paid for the ground, my friend. And here is where the temple is to be built. We'll have to leave right off there today. We'll pick right up there next time, beginning in 1 Kings. I hope you have the notes and outlines, friend. If not, write in right away and ask for your copy.